What's up? Welcome to part three of Crash Course AP Environmental Science. CAFE standards. So CAFE stands for Corporate Average Fuel Economy, and it was a standard that was enacted into law in 1975. It established fuel efficiency standards for passenger cars and light trucks. So all these car manufacturers like Honda, Toyota, Ford, and General Motors had to have an average amount of fuel economy for all their cars throughout their fleet. Flex fuel vehicle. This is a vehicle that runs on either gasoline or a gasoline ethanol mixture. So you might have seen E85 at the pump, and this is what flex fuel is. It's basically a blend of mostly ethanol, which comes directly from corn, which is a type of biomass fuel. Nuclear. There are many different types of nuclear energy, however, there's only one type that is actually possible to be used today, and that's fission. Fission is the process of dividing atoms. On the other hand, you have fusion, which is currently not possible with nuclear plants as we see up there. Fusion combines different atoms, and it's really hard to do because it takes a lot of heat and energy, and it's currently not possible. It's only found in places like the sun, and in the process of fission, People have to use uranium-235 because it's radioactive enough, and mining it and purifying it is a big part of the fuel before it can actually be used. A bacterial and a curie are measurements of radioactivity. They were named after famous scientists. The curie was named after Mary Curie, who did a bunch of work with the atomic structure and nuclear energy. Half-life. So half-life specifies the time taken for the radioactivity of a specified isotope to fall to half its original value. So you can take the ln of 2, because that's part of the half-life formula, to get a half-life value. And people often use half-life to compare the daughter material, the original material, whether that be like carbon or uranium-235. And they compare it to the daughter material, because eventually over time, things start to decay. Primary air pollutants. These are pollutants that are produced by humans and nature. They include carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, SOxs and NOxs, so those are your sulfurs and nitrogens, also different hydrocarbons, gasoline, of which is a type, and different types of particulates. Together, these primary air pollutants can come together and eventually form secondary air pollutants like ozone. Particular matter. The source of all this, of course, comes from the human burning of fossil fuels and also things such as diesel exhaust. So diesel isn't very purified, and so when it's burned, it does release a lot of particulates if it's not properly trapped. The effect is it reduces visibility and can bring respiratory irritation to different places. And to reduce this, you want to filter it. So scrubbers are a way to filter it, and sometimes cars have catalytic converters or special diesel filters for this type of thing. There's also electrostatic precipitators. Those take electrical charges to zap out and trap the particulate matter. And also alternative energy could be a solution. Photochemical smog. So this is also known as brown smog and it comes from particulate matter. And it's usually formed on hot sunny days when NOxs or VOCs, volatile organic compounds, and ozone combine, and then they form this nasty smog, and it's a brownish color. And this is the smog that was characteristic of LA during the 1970s before the Clean Air Act was introduced. Industrial smog, on the other hand, is known as gray smog, and it's the smog that results from emissions from industry and other sources of gases produced by the burning of fossil fuels. So primarily coal is a big contributor to this. And in London, during the Industrial Revolution, they had a period where many people died because there was a ton of this gray smog. And of course, if you breathe too much of it, it's not good, especially if you have pre-existing respiratory issues. Clean Air Act. This was an act that was enacted in 1970, and it set emission standards for cars and limits for the release of air pollutants. So as mentioned, LA was suffering from very bad air quality, as were other places, so Congress had to step in and curb these emissions from tailpipes. Greenhouse gases. Some examples include water, carbon dioxide, 
ozone and chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, and others include things like methane, CH4, which is 25 times more potent at trapping heat than greenhouse then, excuse me, carbon dioxide. And the effect of all these gases is that they trap outgoing, also known as infrared or heat energy, that, and eventually it will cause the Earth to warm. So some sunlight comes in, but these gases in the atmosphere, they prevent some of that gas from actually escaping back into space. So that actually provides a nice warm habitat that we can live in. Although too much of it is bad, of course, and that's what's driving a big part of global warming. VOCs. This stands for volatile organic compounds, and they're hydrocarbon solvents that are used in paints, stains, and other products, and almost everything has a VOC because everything has like odors coming out of it. And they're released into the air during the application of coatings, such as painting, and they react with nitrous oxides and sunlight to form ozone. And ozone, of course, it's good if it's higher up, but if it's at in, on the ground, it can really harm people. Asbestos. This is a long, thin fibrous silicate material that was really used in insulating homes because it did a very good job of it, and it caused cancer when inhaled. And you might have seen all the ads today about mesothelioma, which is a type of lung cancer that can come as a result of this. Radon. Radon is a naturally occurring colorless, odorless, radioactive gas, and it's found in some types of soil and rock. It's found in a lot of basements. It just seeps through the concrete laying down there, and it can seep into these homes and buildings, and it's formed from the decay of uranium, so like the half-life stuff. And this is actually the second biggest cause of lung cancer after smoking. So it's definitely something to be partially concerned about if you're starting to feel sick. Mutagen, teratogens, and carcinogens. So mutagens cause hereditary changes through mutations. They actually will change the DNA structure through mutations. And then, of course, DNA gets passed on from the parent to the child, and that is what is going to cause such a thing to continue on to the next generation. Teratogens are hormones or substances that cause fetus deformities. So when a baby is born, if there were teratogens present, the baby might have certain deformities that will affect this baby's development. And carcinogens are just anything that cause cancer. So there are a lot of carcinogens out in the world, like lead paint, of course. And also some people might even think the sun is a carcinogen because if you're exposed to sunlight long enough, you can get cancer. Thermal pollution. This is when a temperature increase in a body of water is caused by human activity and it has a harmful effect on water quality and on the ability of that body of water to support life. So we see this a lot with thermal plants. So they might produce something and then they have hot water that they need to release. And if they dump it directly into the lake, it's going to affect the fish and other species that live there. Acid deposition. This is caused by sulfuric and nitric acids, H2SO4 and HNO3, and it results in lowered pH of surface waters because these acids, they'll dissociate into H plus ions. And of course that's acidic and will make the whole water more acidic. So this is something that sometimes happens in soil and wants to be limited. Ocean acidification. So this is kind of like acid deposition, but in the oceans. So when CO2 dissolves in seawater, it reacts with water to form carbonic acid, which is H2CO3, I want to say. And of course, when this happens, it's going to lower the ocean pH because once again, the H plus ions are dissociating and entering into the water. And you know, the ocean is such a big carbon sink. So it's going to take in more CO2 if we keep pumping it through greenhouse gas emissions. And for sensitive species like coral, this ocean acidification has been really bad because they can't withstand these new lower pH levels. LD50. This is the amount of a chemical that can kill 50% of the animals in a test population. You'll usually see this in a graph. You have the toxicity dose and you also have the response. So when about 50% of the population has sort of succumbed, you can trace it to the toxicity and that interval point is where you can find the LD50 value. Safe Drinking Water Act. This was an act passed in 1974 and it set maximum contaminant levels for pollutants in drinking water that may have adverse effects on human health. So it was really designed because a lot of water was being polluted and people wanted to 
stay healthy again. So this sort of enforced regulations to clean up the water. Clean Water Act. This was passed in 1972, and it's specifically for water that is just in general places like lakes and rivers. And it set maximum permissible amounts of water pollutants that can be discharged into waterways. So now all these industries, if they were working next to like a river, they had to make sure they weren't dumping any harmful chemicals before because many rivers were even lighting on fire because of all the pollutants. And it aims to make surface water swimmable and fishable. So it's good for us all. Sewage treatment. This is a stage, many municipalities have it, where organic matter and sewage is decomposed by bacteria into carbon dioxide, nitrates and phosphates and sulfates, which can be turned into fertilizer and other inorganic compounds in a wastewater treatment plant. So there are mainly three steps. The first primary treatment removes all the solids, usually through physical filtration. A secondary treatment uses microorganisms that like to eat this kind of waste. And then these organisms fall to the bottom, leaving clean water up top. And tertiary, this water is cleaned through things like ozone and chlorine and other purification processes before it can go back in the environment. Fecal coliform bacteria. So this is an indicator of sewage contamination and many bodies of water. So this type of bacteria is actually something that will live in human intestines. So if you find traces of this in bodies of water, so just drinking water, you know it's probably been contaminated with something such as human waste, and then you should disinfect it. Municipal solid waste. MSW. So this is the refuse collected by municipalities from households, small businesses, and institutions. And usually this type of waste is processed through two types of removal. One type is the clay line landfill, which we'll talk about later. And another type is the incinerator, which is basically just burning all the solid waste that is collected. Leachate. So in a clay line landfill, Sometimes there's polluted liquid that will pass through the clay layer, even though clay is very porous and not very permeable, sometimes stuff will still get through. And this thing that gets through is called leachate. And it happens when water passes through buried wastes in a landfill. And oftentimes these clay landfills, they'll have these collection ponds in the bottom to take out this leachate and dispose of some other way, such as through a big retention pond like this. Super fun, CERCLA. So CERCLA stands for the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act. And along with it, its shortcut name is the Superfund. And it's basically a monetary fund that was created by Congress in 1980 to clean up hazardous waste sites. So money from this fund comes from taxing chemical products and companies who many times are responsible for these toxic wastes that end up in people's backyards or in the soil sometimes. And one of the greatest examples was Love Canal, New York, which was a small town community that had to be, the people had to be removed because it was living on top of bad waste from an industrial plant earlier. So this is why stuff like this is needed. RCRA stands for the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. This was an act in that, in that ex, excuse me, enacted in 1976 to give the EPA the cradle to grave authority over hazardous waste. So the shortcut name for this is cradle to grave, and it basically allows the EPA to track especially toxic chemicals from the cradle part when it's just beginning to be manufactured all the way to the grave, so when it's disposed of. So let's say there's a very bad paint. So the EPA is able to monitor this paint from when it's just starting to be made all the way until it's disposed. Brownfield. This is a property which has the presence or potential to be a hazardous waste, pollutant, or contaminate site. And these fields, generally they're useless because of course there's bad stuff underneath, but some brown fields have slowly over time been able to become recovered and many of these places such as if there's a landfill below people will actually cover it with grass or something and turn it into a park so that's always a good thing that might come out of a brown field. Endangered species. This is a group of organisms in danger of becoming extinct if the situation is not improved. Many times we see climate change as a big driver of this and the, for these species the population numbers have dropped below the critical number of organisms and so they're really at risk of being gone if humans don't stop destroying their habitats or try to save them. So some examples are the northern spotted owl, the arctic polar bear, and many others. So sea turtle, African rhino, types of penguins, 
and even like frogs, which are unique to many fragile ecosystems in tropical rainforests. Endangered Species Act. So this was an act passed in 1973, and it helps to identify threatened and endangered species. So threatened aren't endangered yet, but they're at risk of being so in the U.S. And it's also it also puts protection ahead of economic considerations. So if these types of animals are losing their habitat a lot, the EPA might come in and they might try, or another federal agency might try to come in and stop say logging to prevent the loss of certain frogs that are going extinct or becoming threatened really quickly. And finally, we have the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, CITES. So this was passed in 1973, and it lists species that cannot be commercially traded as live specimens or wildlife products. So a lot of these species, some people think there are medicinal benefits or based on folklore or other things. Or some of these species, such as the tiger, some people like tiger fur or whatever. And so many times they're hunted out in the wild and poaching is a big problem, hunting these animals illegally. So this treaty tries to prevent the trade of important things that these animals could produce, such as ivory. So this is something that's been in place to try to curb the whole endangered species list and phenomena. Okay. So that's basically it. Thanks so much for following along for these 99 terms. I hope you found this helpful. Thanks so much for watching. Please make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Also like, comment, and share these videos with your friends. Also, you can find the full AP playlist over here if you want to watch crash courses on other subjects. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you in another one.